All right. All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming out to Startup Boston Week 2021. Um, I'm really excited to be here. This is my third year doing uh, Startup Boston Week. So at this point, it's a fun annual tradition for me to get to see all of your faces, whether it's in person or through Zoom, you know? Um, so again, I'm Andy. I'll be your MC for today's event. Um, on my screen, you'll see the sessions that are currently happening right now. So if you are not here by minute by minute pitching, uh, go ahead and click the agenda button and find the one you want to be at. If you are here, welcome. We're super excited to have you. Um, so uh, while we wait for some people to just quickly navigate around, um, just as a reminder, we absolutely love questions. Uh, we have a Q&A tab. I promise we are looking at it. Me and Brandon are both going to be checking it. Um, I'll be sending them to Brandon's way if he doesn't see them immediately. Um, and so, you know, we're really excited to get questions. That's why we create this conference. It's for you all to get feedback uh, and give uh, give our experts a chance to respond to you all. Um, so with that said, um, thanks so much for your time. And I'm going to hand it over to Brandon for what's sure to be a great session. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate that introduction and super excited because I have the opportunity to speak to people I speak to on a fairly regular basis, uh, being able to work with a lot of them. And a couple of the founders that are with me today, I'll allow, allow them to introduce themselves, uh, are alumni of the DCU Fintech Innovation Center, of which I'm the operations manager for. I also have with me Vasilios Russos, who's uh, actually my boss, the managing director of the center. And uh, this is a topic that I know he holds very near and dear to his heart. The topic of today is focusing on pitching frameworks. You know, How do you cater a pitch around the time that you have allotted to you, as well as really the person that's sitting across the table from you? And there's a lot of different kind of deviations of your foundational pitch that we can dive into. But before we dive into the content, I wanna quickly pass it off to our panelists to introduce themselves. I'd love to start with Costa Ligris. There you go, Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that little latency there on the unmute. <laughs> um, we're all used to so many different platforms. So um, thank you for being here. My name is Costa um, Ligris. I am um, the CEO and co-founder of Boston Fintech Stavi, um, which uh, looks to take transactions that have traditionally been done in person and on paper uh, to a digital platform. Um, and uh, super excited to be uh, representing um, DCU as an alum of the Fintech Innovation um, center, which I think is just a remarkable asset in our ecosystem. I also serve as an entrepreneur in, re uh, in residence and a lecturer at Sloan, um, where I teach uh, entrepreneurship and uh, and uh, strategic management. So really excited to be here. Wonderful. Thank you, Costa. Uh, Nadia? Hi, everyone. I'm Nadia Shalabi. I am uh, also another uh, GCU center um, alum of one of their portfolio companies, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pakira, and we are bringing uh, physical uh, commodity supply chains into the digital age. We can even talk to me later about what, what that means. But yeah, I've, um, I'm a repeat entrepreneur, so uh, so what we're gonna talk about is, is really hard. So if you're trying it, I feel for you, <laughs> and we'll try and help from our own personal experiences and fallouts. Excellent. And Vasilios. Hello there, Managing Director of the DCU Fintech Innovation Center. And so we're a nonprofit uh, fintech startup accelerator, helping startups and founders uh, go from pre-production to market fit as best as we can. Excellent. So to open up the conversation, this question's uh, very general in nature and for all three of you. So feel free to jump in. But before we start and move towards deviations of a foundational pitch, we have to have a foundational pitch. Right, exactly what it is that our company is doing, our value proposition. So how do you know as a founder or as someone who's mentoring a founder, if they've actually nailed down a general elevator pitch, what questions should they be answering in the few minutes that they have with the audience that they have in front of them? Um, we'd love to start with Nadia. 
Yeah, so I'll give a very vanilla answer. Um, most of the resources that you would look at and the, all the pitches on how to pitch will say the problem, um, no matter how great of a speaker you are and how great of a solution you have, if the audience cannot in 30 seconds identify what problem you're talking about, it's 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 a lost cause, whether it's a minute or, or 10 minutes. They really need to understand where are you? The world is large and we need to dive in really quickly on the problem. Then we can layer and go into various directions. So that'll be just my, my very quick um, first response. Excellent. How about you, Costa? Yeah, so I think that um, Nadia is touching on obviously the most important element, which is the problem. I think that um, you know a really good pitch also um, elaborates on the value being created, right? And so it, it, we talk a lot about sometimes like this is great, like you have a wonderful solution that's looking for a problem to solve, and so it's that intersection between what is the problem and how are you solving it, and based on how you're solving it. What type of value is it creating for your potential customers or stakeholders? And Vasilios, this is something that we talk about a lot, and you've been able to impart a lot of wisdom to me, but please feel free to share with the audience your thoughts on it. Yeah, it, so to be honest, it's very difficult to understand, especially from a general audience, uh, whether your pitch has landed on the mark. Um, and so what it takes is a ton of um, uh, kind of user sampling along the way. And so you have to absolutely do the two things uh, are essential that, that Nadia and Costa talked about, which is what's the problem, what's the value prop, right? So what is it and why does it matter, right? In addition, um, something that we'll certainly talk about today is sort of audience and know thy audience, right? And ultimately what you're trying to get across to that person so that they are won over is, um, is it compelling to that individual, right? Um, does it fit? for what that person uh, is interested, like why they're interested in connecting with startups? Does it help them achieve their goals? And was the presentation exciting um, enough that they wanna sort of lean in and learn more? Um, and, uh, you know, so one of the things I say is it's good that somebody asks questions, but are they asking the right questions? Are they asking questions that are helping them clarify because you weren't clear on what you're saying? Or are they asking questions to help them get a deeper understanding of what you're working on. And so I think if there's any litmus test, it's around understanding uh, what and why people are asking you questions and if they are um, after you finish your pitch. And so kind of one pro trip that I say is always bring somebody along with you who can take down notes of every single question that you receive. And if you start getting a pattern over and over and over, it either means that you're doing something right or there's something that you need to work on. And now branching off of that and kind of shortening that elevator pitch or foundational pitch to what we call that one liner, or as you sometimes call that Twitter pitch, right? Can you tell me a benefit of having what they, what we call a Twitter pitch or that shorter pitch and why it's so important to have alongside your foundational? Yeah, absolutely. So um, whatever analogy that you want to use or a statement that, you know, people now have a goldfish memory of seven seconds. And so you got to get your uh, message across in that. Um, or as Mark Twain said, if I had more time, I'd write you a shorter letter. Um, mm -hmm. It takes time and effort to synthesize things down. Um, and so the Twitter pitch that it's really a construct. That's all it is. It's a construct to get your message into 160 characters. Um, and so can you synthesize your the purpose of your company and why someone should care into 160 characters? Um, and that's uh, that kind of the introductory one. Uh, at the center, we actually go a bit further. And what we do is we use a, a lean canvas model. So what's the problem? What's the value prop? What's the market, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we have people, uh, work through what I call uh, an hourglass approach. And so just write it down, right? You're because there's, for example, why is it difficult to synthesize things down into 160 characters and why do people um, fall into putting a longer pitch in place? And that's because 
sometimes you have complex things. You have multi-party systems. So how can I provide the value prop to the user versus the value prop to my customer versus the value prop to the sort of vendors that are integrating to my software? They're all different, right? You can't um, dump all of that information on somebody. Um, so begin that process and fill out all of that information. And then through iteration, you synthesize it down to 160 characters. So can I get my a unique value prop in 160 characters? Can I get my market addressable market in 160 characters? Can I get my problem for the audience that I am speaking to in 160 characters or less? Um, and that will provide not only clarity and um, what and why you're saying something, but it will really help your entire team and all the people who are speaking about you to understand um, uh, what you're trying to get across with that first impression kind of goldfish um, perspective. Um, and then you can continue to build off of that. We find that it's incredibly useful um, to use these components as Lego blocks because you can mix and match them uh, for the right environment that you're speaking at, whether it's uh, a dinner party round table um, or whether it is, uh, you know, literally an elevator pitch. So before you, you're in an elevator with somebody, do they even want to hear your two minute elevator pitch? Well, giving them that sort of Twitter pitch and them saying, that's interesting. Tell me more. Um, then you can go into your, your elevator pitch. So very useful. Yeah, that's excellent. And so you mentioned kind of lean canvas as a, maybe a starting point to help you get to synthesize what exactly it is you want to get across. So I'm curious from Costa and Nadia's perspective, you know, you guys have been MIT mentors for a long time and entrepreneurs and residents, as well as uh, huge uh, alumni and mentors for the center, um, current cohort members would love to know what other frameworks or what other things really help that person is trying to lay out exactly what it is they want to say. Facilio was mentioned Lean Canvas. Was wondering if there's under other tools that come to mind. Uh, we'd love to uh, start with Costa. Yeah. So, so first of all, um, I'm a fan of Lean. Um, I think Lean Canvas is a is a great framework. Um, you know, I'm familiar with all of them on, enough to be dangerous. I think a lot of the components sort of you know uh, use different nomenclature to sort of attack sort of the same concepts. You know, for me personally, when I'm talking to, to founders, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the struggle is being able to be concise. They go on and on and on and on, and they spend a tremendous amount of time. And so for, for me, the, the hack has always been, and of course, it depends on who your audience is, but generally speaking, one of the challenges that, um, that, that we have, and this is, a, this is not any sort of famous framework other than practice makes perfect, I, I really try to urge people to, to practice their pitch in front of people that know nothing about what they're doing. Um, and that's important because even as mentors, right, um, you know, Vasilios and Nadia and I can listen to, um, to a pitch and still get really critical and take notes and dissect it. But what, you have a bias because you, you know about your team, you know about the founders, you know about their business. So you are making uh, connections with respect to uh, some of the dialogue uh, that may be coming out of that uh, conversation or some of the content in the pitch. And it's really important to understand that when you present it to somebody that has not been familiar with the company or the founder or the idea, and you really just listen to them, um, that is, uh, you get you get a, a ton of, you know, it's gold in terms of what you get back for feedback. Um, the other thing that we really encourage, especially in the accelerator, is for people to record themselves and watch their pitches. Um, and so this, you know, this may not necessarily be framework, but this is really, these are great, simple tools. You know, take your $1,200 supercomputer that we all have in the palm of our hands now, record yourself, listen to the tone, listen to what you're, what you're saying, have a list of wh whatever framework you're using, whether it's lean or any of the other ones, but like it doesn't really matter which one it is. Um, and understand, am I articulating the problem? Am I showing the value? If I can get to it within a period of time, have I shown why us? Like, why is this team the, the right team to solve um, to solve this problem and create the value? And Nadia, anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, so 100% agree with uh, everything Costa said. I would just like to um, maybe bring in a different dimension um, that 
also can um, affect the pitch and something like the lean canvas, which I mostly use when uh, when mentoring people or being on like, you know, uh, various uh, boards of startups or so on, is a good, um, is, is actually a good framework for the team itself to identify where it is and the stage. Because um, often you're like, oh, we have this idea or whatever, and we finally, like, let's say you're in fintech, we got, um, uh, and uh, we, we got a meeting with somebody at Bank of America, and you think like, okay, you made it, and you're off to the races and so on, but you start to fill out the Lean Canvas model, and you realize that you really don't have a lot of this figured out yet, and there's a lot of work to do, and that can inform your pitch, and you also you also need to be very aware of yourself first as to what stage you're at, and then when you're answering questions, you say we we're you know planning to go this direction. We haven't yet addressed X or Y. You you also want to be genuine in the in the Q and A. So I think just speaking of the frameworks, they help you assess where you are because as Costa said, when you're working on something, you're basically you and your team, this is all you see all the time and you kind of get to drink your own Kool-Aid and, and other people who don't know anything about your business as well as a framework like this is a good um, kind of checkpoint to, for you to, uh, to assess yourself and, and, and have, um, have like a self-assessment. Excellent. So now that we kind of have that foundation set, if we're going on a, basically a timeline or a story, now we got to create derivatives of that potential foundational pitch, right? And so regardless of who the audience might be, what are the questions that I need to dive deeper on in order to better cater my pitch to that audience person? Now it's going to vary depending on that audience member, obviously, and we'll get into some of those examples. But what questions are you asking yourself now as you try to cater it into a more specific approach. And we'd love to hear from Costa first. Yeah, so, you know, for me, it's always a function of really understanding your audience. So who am I talking to? Why am I talking to them, <laughs> right? Um, not, to, not, not, not to sound cliche, but like start with a why. And so why am I talking to them? What is, what is it that they, what, mess, what message do I need to get across to them? And what message are they looking for? Because like Vasilio said, we live in a world now where especially, uh, especially with social media and the ability to connect virtually, our, uh, our window in terms of getting people's attention and being able to retain their attention continues to shrink. Um, not a goldfish, by the way, I looked that up. That's an urban, it's an urban legend. We, you know, they actually have decent memory. Um, but the reality is really understanding uh, understanding the background. And so what that means is if you're a B2B business and you are presenting something to them and you want to try to solve a pain point or a problem that they have, you really you better understand the pain point, <laughs> right? And you better understand what those what, what that is. I think one of the biggest um, you know pet peeves that I have always is, uh, when people put up a competitive landscape sort of scenario and they talk about how we differ from others, whether it be first mover advantage or we do this and they don't do that. When you're, especially in my background in B2B tech, especially in B2B tech, you are typically trying to disrupt your most dangerous competitor is the status quo. They are currently using email or fax machines or UPS that is your biggest competitor is displacing that or getting them to change off of a workflow. And so really understanding how they work, how they operate, what are the pain points that they have and how do I articulate to them the value that I am going to create? And, and Nadia, playing off of Costa's answer there as a starting point, you know, how can you make sure that you're catering your pitch to this new person, asking yourself those additional questions and not getting sucked into a rabbit hole uh, and as Cecilia mentioned earlier, you know, talking too further and too much into the problem and losing sight of your value prop or what it is that you're in that meeting for. How can you make sure you stay on message? Yeah, that's a that, that, that's a hard one. But um, just just practice the discipline, practice with a lot of people that don't know anything about the, the company. Um, but also, if, if you're following a framework, you um, depending on what company you are, you set a goal for yourself to convey 
three things or four things, depending on, on the level of complexity. And that's what you convey. And, um, you know, you can watch some politicians that are very good at staying on message. So they would um, they would be asked um, some, you know, rabbit hole question and they would say, yes, of course. And they would just answer with point number three that has not been brought up yet that they want to convey. You don't have to be quite as crude, but 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 somehow pivoting to what you want to convey that is about staying on message. And it's hard because you want to connect with your audience. You want to give them what they want. But at the same time, you have like a goal to deliver one, two or three points. Um, so so that's that's my first answer. And um, the second is kind of the flip side of the coin of what Costa was talking about. So Costa was talking about who your audience are. You need to cater to your audience and uh, what their background is, what are they interested in and so on. So the other side is, this is why what we're talking about is not necessarily a one size fits all, is what is your startup? What is your company? Whether it's B2B or B2C, does everybody know what you're doing? Are you like re redoing email? You don't need to talk about the problem. Everybody knows that email is, email is problematic. You say, email is horrible. We're going to fix it, and then you can spend more time on on how you're fixing it and why you. Whereas something like my company, which never no one has ever heard about physical commodities trading, we need to spend more time on situating people. Just like where is this and is it in the world? So depending on um, your uh, company. Uh, the value proposition that you're build, that you're bringing to what field and how familiar people are, your audience with that, this is what you um, you need to focus on. And the derivatives would be again very very dependent on um, on that aspect as well, right? Like consumer companies are a lot easier to get right away for for anybody. And then you can spend um, spend time on other things. Whereas B two B companies, if people are not as familiar, even if sometimes they're investors, but not necessarily in that space, uh, you need to spend more time um, clarifying and digging into that aspect. If I can, and if I can we talked about the. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Costa. Yeah, I just want to. I want to add something before I forget it, which is question the power of questions and the power of sort of setting up some framework around what you want to accomplish. Uh, I, I just don't see, see people do this enough, which is if you're going into a sales call with a potential customer, asking them, hey, what do you want to get out of today? We're, we get so excited sometimes to jump in there and tell them about what we're building, what we're doing. And, uh, and, and that can really help you steer that conversation. Things such as if you like what you hear today, what do you want to save the last five minutes of our call to, to talk about? Or what are next steps? I have seen so many calls where things are going great and everyone's sort of excited and then everyone has a hard stop and then it's done. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there are no, because the pitch is the hook, right? It's just the beginning. And, uh, and I think that the, the question uh, and the, and the level setting in terms of expectations is something that is very, very frequently missed. Yeah. And I can, I, I just want to add one more thing to that because I, fully agree. And when I actually do that, and I want to tell everyone, especially from my side, do as I say, and not as I do, I don't always follow exactly what we're supposed to be doing. But when I do do that, it's very effective. So at one point, some investor reached out to us, we weren't fundraising or anything. And um, of course, I have a pitch, of course, like we have a time and whatever. But then that I asked, what are you looking to, you know, to get from this conversation? And he said, um, I'm just looking for us to have a conversation. So just like, just have a conversation, understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. And really no pitch. So we never brought up the slides. It was extremely productive, effective. He said, we really want to stay in touch. As soon as you start fundraising, please like reach out and so on. So um, that's what he wanted. And it was very cordial. Like that was the first time I met him, but it really worked because of that magic question that I asked. And um, that's, you know, we were able to uh, have a very effective conversation. Go ahead, V. Yep. Thanks, Nadia. I, I want to just kind of jump in and, and um, continue to drive the nail on a couple of things that, that Costa had said earlier, which is about knowing your audience, knowing what you're there for. Um, and I think Costa was right on. And 
Uh, again, it's a busy world for everybody. And as a result, um, people, kind of startup founders, uh, people who are asking for things, don't do the level of detailed homework that they should. In doing so, really differentiate you. Uh, cost them multiple times uh, at the center um, was recognized by our mentors who came up to me afterwards and said that that, you know, Costa particularly was very prepped um, in understanding who I, am, who I am and as a result asked very pointed questions that showed that he was uh, intelligent and prepared and was able to derive more value out of the meeting than others. Um, and so when people uh, go out of their way to make a compliment like that, uh, you know it, it matters. Um, and so why does that matter? Um, and, and why uh, am I sort of really drilling this home? So we'll, we ask all our startups to write down questions before they go into the meeting to make sure that there's a process of being disciplined. And um, a lot of folks will say, I understand that this person is an enterprise. I understand that this person is a VC. I understand these kind of surface level categories. And as a result, here's the sort of general questions that I will ask for them. Um, and this is what I want to get out of the meeting. And so the agenda becomes, I'm asking questions um, not because they will specifically make me smarter, but because they were, they will generally lead me to the goal that I want, mm -hmm. right? And this is what is critically important: is to always focus on delivering value to the other person. So, how have you made that person across the table more successful, right? Um, have, how have you helped them move forward to their own personal objectives and goals? So let, let me give an example for this. Instead of just asking the VC, well, what's your investment thesis? What are your parameters? What stages do you invest in? The sort of general questions that um, you could ask anyone. Instead, look to the specific partner level. What deals have they been invested in? do those correspond to your segment or is there another partner in the firm that corresponds to, to your segment? What is their particular background and how might that incline them to ask questions about you or you to answer questions for them? So are they an investment banker by background? And so they're going to be analytical and financial oriented. Are they a startup entrepreneur and operator and therefore have a different model? Are they a lifelong VC and will be completely sort of market driven business model focused? Um, and so that will help you, again, ask very specific questions, which will drive a more interesting conversation with that person. They will therefore remember you more. And because they had that more engaged conversation, are more willing to want to have a follow up meeting with you. Mm -hmm. um, people don't, I think, think about. Uh, exactly what they want to get out of a meeting with enough detail. So you're meeting an investor. Obviously, you want them to invest in the company. But your prior goal, uh, your media goal is, I just want to get a second meeting. I want to get a second meeting and I want to get an understanding of what path I am on in the organization. So is am I today ready to get an investment by this firm? Or what are the things that I need to accomplish to be able to get an investment by that firm? And if so, um, how do I come back to you after I've accomplished the things that you need me to accomplish? Those are just some examples. It's the same thing with kind of customers. We go into all of those in details, but all you're trying to do is move one step forward by understanding uh, how to succeed, how to help that person succeed in their world. Well, that's a perfect segue. So let's get into one of those types of examples. You mentioned kind of investors, VCs, or angels, right? They're going to be looking for something out of a pitch that maybe a different audience member is not going to be looking for. So, you know, this is a tougher question because you're kind of looking across industries being at this is Boston Startup Week. Mm -hmm. But what exactly is it in particular? And I'm going to throw this out to both of you. Uh, hopefully, Costa can join back in. I know he had some technical difficulties. But what we're looking at is what is it that a particular uh, VC or angel might be looking for to hear from you as a founder. That's going to be different from any other types of pitch you would normally have. Uh, I'd love to hear from uh, Nadia. So specifically on the VC side. 
VC, yeah. angels, someone who's ready yeah. to fund help so, you. So VCs and angels and investors in general, especially if they are institutional or they've been doing this for a while, they are professionals at what they do. So they have a system and they're not going to make an exception for you because you're cool or because you connected or whatever. They connect, they, they see thousands of pitches and they connect with thousands of people every year and uh, they only invest in a handful, right? And so they have a system and they have that down. So, uh, so you need to break through that if you're interested in, um, uh, in that particular firm or, or that particular investor. And uh, so what you want, the, the most important thing, if you don't know this investor already, is for them to assess who you are. To them, this is more important than the, the company itself or, or what you're doing. Because if they decide that they've had, um, and some of it is just statistical with their own experience and there's nothing you can help with that, you can help um, um, here, but they, they have a process that they go through. And so uh, the first thing they try to assess is how competent you are. And then if you're first time entrepreneur, a bunch of other things about your character, about how you solve some problems, who your co-founders are, how you're building the team, your ability to carry this forward, uh, your perseverance. So you'll be amazed at how much of this they assess by just asking some, some simple questions. So you need to be prepared for that and be very uh, concise in how you present that uh, accurately and, and, and genuinely. So I would think that this is uh, the most distinguishing, there's many distinguishing features between an investor pitch and other pitches, but that is the fundamental aspect um, that distinguishes your conversation with the investor from everybody else. Because investors see a ton of startups, a ton of, uh, they know the, what the problems are, there's lots of solutions, and they're going to decide based on the team. Um, and so that's what the, the, the focus is. I mean, this is something we can we can uh, talk about a lot, but I'll let Vasilis and Costa continue where there's many, many other aspects. So I'll extrapolate that to uh, an extreme level here. So at an extreme level, when you meet with someone who's making an investment in you, and that could be a customer. Um, so a customer working with a start, an early startup is a big investment. There's a lot of sort of execution and reputational risk and everything, forget about just the dollars involved. Uh, an investor is obviously putting money in you, literal financial investment, um, but it's really anybody who's spending their kind of time and effort partnership with you. So you've got sort of um, a couple of things that you're focused on, which what's the risk, right? What's the reward, right? And uh, how compelling is this for me? Uh, and VCs and investors want to clearly upfront understand the reward mentality. Right. And I think that that's where kind of a lot of attention goes on. Um, but then ultimately, at some point in this diligence process, they are going to go through and evaluate the risks by the time they check off the boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, financial institutions and regulated institutions uh, are almost the opposite, where they are looking for the things that are of the greatest risk immediately and will sort of cross you off the list before they even get to the reward conversation. Obviously, you've got to tempt them with a little bit of reward for them to even engage with you. Um, but it's really much more sort of on the risk and protection side uh, up front. Um, and that goes back to all of this goes back to understanding your audience at a really acute level. So uh, an angel investor who writes $100,000 checks versus one that writes million dollar checks versus an institutional fund that's a first fund with $20 million versus, uh, you know, a company that's got a, a VC firm that's got a billion plus assets under management. Those folks uh, individually and institutionally are very, very different. Um, and even individual partners within the same firm are different. And if you don't know specifically who you're talking to and what the parameters are, um, 
you cannot change the rules of the game for someone. And I think this is where people strike out is that, that they try and win people over through an abundance of information or arguments or, or what they believe is compelling about them. Right. Um, but that's not what the compelling argument is for the person that you're speaking to. And so that's what you really need to focus on is by understanding those that person. And, and that's, you know, some of the questions that we were referring to earlier up front. So what do you what do you want to get out of this meeting? Right. What is success for you? Right. Uh, for a startup of my stage. Right. Um, do I fit? Right. How would I be a winning decision to move forward with you at this stage? These are the type of questions that you can get. And now you know the box that you um, you can fit in and you know uh, to where to focus on. Because a lot of times uh, people are just driving down the wrong path. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have you know, this sort of one opportunity to meet somebody and uh, like two ships in the night, you've just kind of misaligned in, in interest and perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one, um, it, it's basically a whiff and it happens all the time. So if you right size your ask and you kind of right size your swing, uh, you'll do far better. So Costa, I know you kind of fell off there for a second, but thank, welcome back. Uh, we were talking about specifically, you know, pitching to the investor side, but I want to kind of switch gears a little bit for you um, and how that translates. And it goes back to a lot of things you already mentioned throughout this conversation uh, with a customer pitch, right? We talked about, you know, understanding the pain point, knowing the value proposition on your end, but truly understanding the problem from the opposite perspective. You know, how is it from the things that Nadia and Vasilio has mentioned on the investment side? Do you change it up a bit, specifically trying to partner, whether it's with an enterprise like you've done in the past, um, or within, uh, in specifically the fintech, you know, financial institution, which is a lot of things that we're connected to here. Yeah, so I think the, the first and foremost, um, you know, you touched on the most powerful word, which is partnership, right? Mm -hmm. And so when um, when financial institutions and the larger the institution or, um, or or the more regulated the space that you are touching um, and, and the way that they obviously look at that is you know, the pure sort of, you know, regulatory framework around lending, for example, or, or the size of the organization, who their regulators are, uh, or also... Um, from the risk perspective where they look at if I engage with Nadia's company and they're not here in six months, does that take down the bank or a system of the bank versus mm -hmm. is there a redundancy plan there? Uh, I think understanding that it truly is a partnership and being very honest from the beginning um, with your prospective customer of where your strengths are, where the limitations are, not over promising and under delivering, setting yourself up um, to overpromise and deliver is a very dangerous thing. I think that especially in B2B enterprise sales, especially when you start talking to financial institutions, you see a lot of executives that over the years will move from one institution to another. Everyone knows each other. It is a well-known community, uh, a well-connected community, especially from a regional perspective. And so, you know, uh, nothing is more powerful than your reputation. And so how you approach these partnerships is really important. We recently just did a deal where the customer was really concerned about, look, like we have not seen a product like yours. This is great, but I need to be able to explain if we're sending a multi-year agreement, you know, what this means. And, you know, just having access to the CEO and the co-founders, being able to get on a call to talk about what, what, just tell me, what are your concerns and how can I mitigate them? It, even though it might sometimes make the legal department cringe when we make our, when we're making business decisions, you know, the reality is that, at the end of the day, people understand the, the, the risk, but also the re potential reward and value in engaging with startups. And it is your job to explain to them that you are the type of individual that they want to partner with. Because mm. there will be issues. And I, we've had, we, have, we have pitched lenders, and I have actually told them at the end of the call, I have really enjoyed talking to you. We are not a good fit. We will not save you enough money. You don't do enough volume. You don't do enough of what we do. Those relationships end up becoming really strong relationships. They refer you to colleagues at other places where you are a good fit because people want to do business with people that are authentic and genuine. And the only there's only one way to get there. 
be authentic and genuine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's perfect because a major piece of any of these types of pitches, there's a huge educational component, especially with a lot of startups and the founders that are logged in today listening to this, where the te technology is that's available today is unprecedented in history, right? And so especially on an enterprise level or even a B2C level, there is a huge education component to teaching that end user or, or whoever it might be, why what you're doing is important. We went over those questions already, but how can you balance both educating that audience member without losing them in technical speak, right? Whether it is a B2C company and, you're, and it's just a general user or it is of an enterprise level, Right. How can you make that balance and still have a compelling argument? And I'd love to hear uh, from Vasilios first from a generalized level and maybe some examples from Nadia and Costa. Sure. Uh, so I, I will repeat, repeat the same framework. So sorry, folks, but uh, mm -hmm. tried and true here. It's know thy audience. So, you, you, you know, you're talking, how do I communicate at a sort of technical level what it is that I'm doing and the value that my um, startup has for this particular well, organization? Um, and so if you are speaking to an executive versus a to a director versus a manager versus an end user, those are all very different conversations. Right. And so the value prop and the things that each person prioritizes within that organization, all the way to the CEO, is going to be different. Um, and part of your job is to know exactly um, what these the people within these roles, what is it that they do? What are the objectives that they are responsible for and how can you help them achieve those responsibilities and objectives? Right. And so um, you have to answer it for the individual and then you have to answer it for the person that that individual is responsible to. So that manager needs to present up to their VP. The VP is going to represent up to their executive. The executive is going to be to the CEO. The CEO is going to answer the board. There is always somebody who is um, a gatekeeper or uh, sort of a, a co-decision maker in the process who is not in that room. So the first thing you have to do is get the confidence of the individual in the room by answering what they need to know. Then you need to answer the questions for the people that they are responsible or will walk out of that room and talk to next. Um, and, and there are different ways to do that. Um, sometimes, but it all evolves around having a level of expertise that is not inside that institution, which is why they're going to go outside of that institution. And for a startup, one of the challenging things is um, until you prove your product in the marketplace, you're just a smart person with an opinion. And there are lots of smart people with an opinion. Right. So how do you distinguish yourself and your, you know, you believe you're the best and have the right answer and you're developing this, this fantastic software, right? But that is not credible enough from their perspective. So to the extent that you can have any data validation from the product, and that can be in the tiniest way from the product itself, or um, there's lots of different ways to hack it. And what we're talking about is how, you know, how do you hack it and how do you, how do you show evidence without having it as a sort of pre-production or initial production startup? Um, you know, one of our startups did a development project where they sat down and they studied um, the, the team at a bank and literally wrote down how much time they spent at each of the particular steps in the process consolidated out that information and then came back and said, you know, do you know that this is how your process actually works in the times that are wasted because of these kind of fundamental issues and et cetera, et cetera. That was enlightening to the executive that caused them to be able to move that process forward, even without another product and market. Right. And so that example is how can you make the person that you're working with smarter about the things that they need to deliver on and give them the ammunition to fight and sell for you when they walk out of that room. And that's all you're really doing because you're just always fighting. How do I get to that next one? 
So, Nadia, I'd love to kind of throw it your way and ask, you know, based on what Vasilios was mentioning, are there certain stories that come to mind where that was the case, where you had to find that champion to bring it to that next level without losing them in your initial pitch? Oh, 100%. And I would say it's true for uh, customers. Uh, and it's also, it's true for customers, true for partners, and it's true for investors, especially in venture firms, that uh, it's the same thing. Um, how Vasilius said that uh, if you're, if you're uh, connecting with um, a team member on, at a customer site, that team member has to pitch it and convince his or her boss and uh, at an investment firm, uh, that person is who's going to take on the investment has to convince the investment committee. And so, of course, you have to have a champion. Without having without having a champion, um, you know, if you, if you if you can't establish that champion on the connection, then you're not going anywhere. Who's who's going? To, there's so much competition. Uh, who's going to advocate for you? As for um, as for the the technical and and like the technology and when you pitch the technology and not go into a rabbit hole, I would say, um, I would say as a rule of thumb, again blanket, never talk about the technology mm -hmm. because because there are two in in the context that we're talking about right when we're doing diligence when we're sitting down with a technical team that's different under NDA and so on but in at the level that um, this. Um, this whole session is on, never talk about the technology. That's a waste of time and shows your immaturity and naivete. Because in order to get that first meeting, you had to jump through a hurdle, a certain um, minimum level of credibility in order to get that meeting. So if you're pitching a tech company, you, there's already some minimal acceptance that you have something, you're not blowing smoke. Um, th that's, that's, that's first. And then second, at the other level, if, you are successful in finding a champion and this going forward, that will be, there will be real diligence and they will really dig in. In this um, um, kind of middle space where you got the meeting, which is what we're talking about, you're pitching, but you haven't been uh, kind of gone forward to diligence, it's like there's there's no there's no point you can say how the solution you built is different from others how it's compelling to them how it's it's abolishing risks how it's bringing value that um is un, un, unlike any bit anybody else how you do that is like not uh appropriate in the context that we're talking about so that would just be my uh general comment and and i'm a very 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 technical person like um, i'm like technology all around and so i have to remind myself of this myself not to get caught into that rabbit hole so actually for tech companies i think brandon that's a great question and costa anything you want to add on there I, you know i think i just want to touch on a comment that vasilios made where there are a lot of smart people trying to solve problems in this space. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I've heard over and over and over again um, from the sea level of financial institutions, banks, credit unions, mortgage companies, the like, is it's great. You guys are brilliant. Have you ever banked? Like, have you ever run a bank? Hmm. Do you know what it's like to, to do what we do? Um, and and because nobody really likes being told that their child is ugly. Um, and many times the people that you may be talking to, especially if they're in an innovation role or an executive VP role, um, they're talking to you because they're vetting something out, but they're not the ones that are actually in the trenches. And that's why I think in a lot of organizations, uh, one of the most powerful things is to, to go see and assess, like go down to the floor and like see how the sausage is made. And, and a lot of times that doesn't happen. And so you are, you know, you're sometimes um, trying to explain to them the problem that you solve when they don't understand that there's a problem there and how you address it and how you introduce that concept is not easy. And understanding that this is a process and the first pitch or call with your internal champion is just the, just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and so I think that's uh, the concept of there are a lot of people in the space trying to solve problems that are very, very smart is true 100%. But how many of them are real subject matter experts? Um, that's a much smaller subsegment uh, of of the people in the space that are that are building companies, and uh, and people know that, and it affects uh, a lot of paradigms with respect to engaging with financial institutions. 
Excellent. So I do, I have seen a couple of questions coming through on the Q&A side, but I do want to ask this last one. Uh, I think it's very important and we haven't really touched upon it. It's the ability to storytell, right? Within any of the pitches that you have, regardless of who the customer is. So we talked about what you absolutely need to have in any pitch, right? Um, the, to have the basic framework, regardless of what framework you use, you know, you have to have the problem, solution, value proposition, the team, why you're the best. But what is the benefit of a good storyteller in pitching? Um, and I'll love to start with actually Nadia again. Um, yeah, storytelling is great for a general audience, competitions, um, getting, attracting the attention of a friend, somebody who doesn't know anything about what's going on. If you apply that same model in the, uh, for, in the investment scenario, just beware that it may backfire. So, because again, those people have limited time, they've seen it all, they've heard tens of thousands of stories and they want to check off some boxes. And so connect with them, ask them, do they want that story <laughs> or, or, or not? So I think overall, it's very important in terms of uh, uh, conveying your, your idea in the story um, type format, but with uh, when you're down to like customers and, uh, and in the trenches with customers and investors, you often want them, you want to respond to what they want to be doing, because as Vasilio said, uh, you want to make them to help them be successful. So they know what they're looking for. So uh, don't come with your agenda. Like, yes, you have an agenda, but that is to be responsive with uh, what they're trying to assess. So that would be my, my quick answer on that. But yeah, it's fun to listen to the stories on like, you know, the MIT uh, 100K pitches. And Costa, how about from your experience? So um, I, I, um, I appreciate uh, Nadia's point. I'm gonna respectfully disagree with, with the storytelling narrative in two scenarios, and they are specific. The first is, why did you decide to do this? Because if there is a compelling story there, that's powerful. If you grew up in Appalachia and you did not have access to financial services and your parents lost their home or they, you know, they couldn't get a small business loan and you're actually able to explain to people why this is important to you and why it's personal, that storytelling is very powerful. Not because it makes people cry, not because it makes people warm and fuzzy, not because it gives people goosebumps, but because building companies is freaking hard. And when you are doing it because you're motivated by something very personal, you don't quit. Mm -hmm. You push through. It is an example of the, and it resonates the resiliency that the founder or founders have. The second thing is, it is I agree with Nadia 100% in terms of investors, with the exception of one piece. Investors definitely want to see like, what is the plan? What is, you know, where are we going? What is this going to take and how long is it going to take? But when it comes to like the bigger vision, venture fund and venture capital is in the business of fund management and a two X return on their money is maybe a win for you as a founder. It is not a win for them. And so for them to be able to sit back and say, is this person crazy enough and bold enough to be a game changer, um, I think that resonates. And they do look for a little bit of that misfit, craziness, Steve Jobs, round peg, square hole, hole thing. And Billy, do so you wanna wrap that thought up? Um, should we take some audience questions, Julian? I think a couple of minutes left, and I know there's been some great uh, audience participation there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. One I did want to mention uh, from Dan, or Dane Hotch, Hotchkiss, sorry. Um, the idea of being able to answer the questions that you wanted them to ask, uh, how can you kind of lead a horse to water in a lot of these kind of pitch scenarios to drive or already know the questions that they're going to have? Uh, so I'll jump in there and and again you have to know your audience and what's the purpose if you are in a public pitch competition um you, you want to get your message across for that particular audience under that particular auspices of that competition if it is a customer or a vc you have to 
make sure you are not driving your agenda, right? Your objective is to get the thing that they, that they can offer. So a customer can offer you a customer contract, uh, VC or angel can invest you funding, right? So the only real question is, how can I help move them down that process, which is going to get them to say yes, right? And so what can I do today, right? That's going to get them interested in saying yes to me and get them to have confidence in me to take a second meeting where we, because you will never answer all questions. You will never get complete confidence in a two minute pitch, a 10 minute pitch, a two hour meeting, right? It's a number of meetings. So all you're trying to do is be effective and, and, um, Again, moving things forward for that person that you are speaking to. Because the last thing that they want is um, to be hearing messages to questions that they don't value. And actually, I would love to ask this one to uh, Nadia to kind of uh, follow up on her thoughts around avoid the technical details in a lot of pitches. You know, what other areas are, can be pitfalls in the pitch that you should probably avoid speaking about? whether it's based on your experience um, as an entrepreneur or even as an advisor? Oh, the pitfalls. Um, so uh, going, um, walking the one, if the time is short, walking your audience through how you segmented the market, because that could be a very tedious and analytical exercise. And so that's akin to something also very technical that you've done, you're very proud of, you had a whole team, it's very successful, you wanna prove that you're very genuine, but that's not appropriate because it loses people and you can just say, this is the TAM and this is where, what we're targeting, right? And, and just go from there. If people wanna check due diligence, take that second meeting, third meeting, they will dig in later. So, uh, so that's, that's one example. Uh, going into uh, too detail into competition, again, you can try and uh, um, abstract that a little bit. Excellent. And Costa, this one from uh, Mayur Sharma. This is, uh, I think it'll be used as from a customer side as well, but how do you go about finding that lead investor, pitching to that lead investor, or even that first customer? And how is that different from, you know, your second or third investor or customer? What is it that's going to be different about that process? Yeah, you know, my, my take on, on, on venture or risk capital is, especially in a market that's frothy, uh, finding people that are interested in investing um, is not as difficult as it used to be. It's finding the right people. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, people that understand the space, people that have a similar alignment with respect to what it is that you're doing. If you are building software that you know, banks don't buy what you're going to build, right? And so what we build, for example, we know our life cycle, uh, excuse me, our sales cycle is long. It takes lenders a long time to get through understand the process and so on and so forth. And so uh, having that type of alignment and understanding um, that your investor is familiar and comfortable with that. And I think that that's an important, uh, that is very important for your lead investors, especially ones that are gonna lead around and potentially have a board seat. Because um, the reality is that that alignment is necessary for the board to be able to be supportive of the decisions that need to occur going, uh, you know, happening in the future. I think that you need to vet your investors just as much as they need to vet you. Understand how do they behave in the boardroom? How have they done with respect to other investments? How have they supported follow-ons? What have they done if there's bridge financing necessary because of something going on? Uh, and right now, you're in a very interesting state of the world where you can go back and see companies that were funded by somebody then had to pivot during the pandemic for better or for worse and see how those investors behaved. Uh, and, and what that looked like. And so it's really spending time and understanding the alignment. Are these people that I want to be able to deal with? The, the one thing I always tell my students is as soon as you have an investor that gives you a list of founders to talk to that have had successful exits and have done well, hand them the list back and tell them to give you a list of companies that have failed. Those are the references you want to talk to. Excellent. I know we're on our last 45 seconds here. So I'd love to just kind of quickly go around and ask, how can people get and stay in touch with you and learn about what you're working on, uh, whether it's through LinkedIn or, or a personal site? Uh, Nadia? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Please feel free to reach out. Um, also, Nadia at Pakira.com. Perfect. And Costa? Yeah, so everything is Kligris. Kligris at stabby.com, Kligris at mit.edu, and Kligris on Twitter and LinkedIn. And Vasilios. Uh, reach me at uh, LinkedIn. That's the best way to do that. So Vasilios Russos, um, I think the link is here. And just mention that you heard me as boss of part of Boston Startup Week. Thank you very much. Well, I just want to thank the panel. I know we're running on short, so thank you very much, very much, everyone. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Yeah, so we're offline now. <laughs> no, we're still live. We are still uh, live. Great. Excellent. So uh, thank you, everyone. Cool. Uh, just to a quick wrap up. Thanks so much for the great session. Thank you to our speakers who have given their time, not just now, but beforehand, preparing and having the chance to talk with our moderator beforehand. Uh, thank you to our moderator for putting together this event. And uh, thank you to everyone else who made this possible. Uh, we have tons of more awesome content uh, coming up that's happening right now and for the next few days. So go ahead and check out our agenda at the top of the screen and hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye everyone.